So we have such a great presentation ahead of you today, and we are so lucky to have Dr. Jerome Fitcher. Uh, Dr. Fitcher completed his PhD at the University of Miami and at the Applied Marine Physics Group in 2007, followed by a postdoc at the University of California, Santa Cruz from 2007 to 2010, where he has remained and is currently an assistant professor in the Ocean Sciences Department. His main research interest focuses on understanding how the interactions between the physical, biological, and chemical processes shape the response of the coastal marine ecosystems that span planktonic organisms to higher trophic level species, such as foraging fish and top predators. We are so glad to have Jerome as one of our speakers as his interest area and presentation addresses one of our US Clivar POS panel priorities, and that is the marine ecosystem dynamics for climate at the coast. Further, this presentation is one of several oriented around the theme of quantitative and foraging ecology in preparation for the joint U.S. Clivar and OCB ecological forecasting workshop, which is in April of 2022. Um, and to that effect, uh, Jerome will be presenting recent advances in marine ecosystem modeling in the California current, and I will hand it over to him. Thank you again so much for presenting today. Yeah, all right. Thank you for the introduction, Michelle, and thank you uh, to the panel for the invitation to uh, speak today. Um, so the the topic was sort of broad, so I put together a presentation who that hopefully will be informative on some of the recent advances that we've done in terms of ecosystem modeling in the California current and mostly in terms of trying to link uh, environmental variability to the population dynamics and foraging pattern of different higher trophic, trophic level species and put all this in the context of being able to do simulations that are long enough to look at an extended historical period or climate projections uh, to the end of the century. Uh, obviously, what I'm going to present today covers a lot of ground and there are contributions from many different collaborators that I would like to acknowledge here first. And I'm not going to read the list, but many people um, over the years have contributed to this work as well as several funding agencies who have you know, allowed us to sustain this effort and keep moving it forward. And because this is so interdisciplinary in nature, it does require uh, funding from many different agencies to be able to put these uh, such models together. So I'll start with the picture, and this is what we're trying to get at with the model framework that I'm presenting today, is that can we build a model that can predict ecosystem hotspots in a broader sense and understand what leads to the formation of an ecosystem hotspots and how those have changed historically and may change in the future under um, different climate conditions. So we can certainly try. Um, and one approach or the approach that we've used, and I want to emphasize here that there are other ecosystem models out there that do things a little bit differently and that uh, can address different questions. I'm thinking of models like Atlantis or Ecopass with Ecosim that are more food web models, uh, that they do a lot more species, but you, in that process, lose the ability to perhaps mechanically, mechanistically interpret what is driving change in the environment and in the population of the species that you're interested in. So this model is built more to be what is called an end-to-end -end model or a climate to fish model, where you're only focusing on a few species, but you're trying to understand the linkages between the physical, the biogeochemical variability, the response of a target species um, like forage fish, sardine and anchovy, and then how that may in turn affect fishing conditions or other predators that rely on those species. And so we developed this ecosystem model within the ROMS framework, and ROMS here is the Regional Ocean Modeling System. And the reason we did this is because you need to represent the environment well with sufficient horizontal resolution, especially in coastal areas, so that you capture the processes. And you know, if you think about the California current and the strongly driven coastal upwelling regime, 
you have to resolve the scales where the physical and the biogeochemical variability occurs so that you can understand their impact on, say, forage fish, for example. And ROMS is well established. It's a community model. It runs very efficiently in parallel computation. So it's, it's relatively easy to do multi-decadal high resolution. And by high resolution here, I mean, you know, three to five kilometer horizontal resolution. Uh, there are tools through which you can do downscale climate projection, grid nesting, data simulation, and so on. So this is really, you know, the basis of, of the ecosystem model is to be able to represent the environmental variability. Uh, and obviously, to make the link to the higher trophic level species, you need some prediction of phytoplankton and zooplankton, which I call here the biogeochemistry, and that can be any model that you like. Uh, however, you need enough resolution in the phytoplankton and the zooplankton functional group so that you can specify prey type for your um, higher trophic level species. So in this case, we picked a model that's originally based on the, the NIMRO um, model that was developed for the North Pacific. The reason we picked that model is because there is three zooplankton functional group, uh, micro, meso, and predatory zooplankton, which, which is in a way uh, parameterized to be krill. And so that gives us enough resolution in the prey field so that we can start understanding uh, changes in the relative concentration of those three zooplankton functional group may affect the foraging patterns and distribution of, say, forage fish. And obviously, when you go to um, looking at higher trophic level species, you have to make a decision on how you're going to represent those uh, species in the model. And here we made the decision to use an individual base model. Um, so I'd say except for the fishing fleet, which is an agent based model, but uh, small detail. But so the approach that was taken here is to treat um, those higher trophic level species as individual and use an individual base model coupled to ROMs and the biogeochemistry. Um, and you, you're probably some fairly familiar with ocean models and biogeochemical models, um, maybe a little bit less so with um, IBMs or individual base models. So I just wanted to take um, a little bit of time here to give you an overview of you know, what is in an individual base model. And um, essentially the two main part that you need is a bioenergetics part, which is telling you how those fish are going to grow in response to feeding. And there are different um, ways you can do this. There's a model called the Wisconsin model that looks at, you know, the consumption uh, balance by your activity and metabolic losses. There is a dynamic energy budget approach where it, the fish essentially decide how much of the energy acquired through consumption is allocated for growth and allocated for reproduction. Uh, but they all kind of get at the same point in trying to predict how resources are allocated um, for a given species. And it turns out that this is actually probably the easier part of running an individual, individual base model because those uh, bioenergetics equations are fairly well established and their parameterization can be derived based on lab experiments. A much more complicated component of indi individual base model is behavior or movement. And it's more complicated because we can't exactly ask the fish why they go where they go when they go. And so you have to often use a variety of behaviors depending on what you know about the particular species that you're trying to model. And if you go on the scale from dumb fish to smart fish, the dumbest fish would be a behavior that's random walk. So in the sense you're moving the fish through the environment in the sense like, yeah, whatever, I do what I want, I, I don't care. Um, but obviously that's probably not realistic, but if you were to implement any kind of active behavior, you would have to demonstrate that you do better than random walk. Otherwise there's no point implementing your more fancy behavior model. 
And so at the other end of the scale, you have the smartest fish possible is a fish that knows everything in the environment that's surrounding it. And then it makes a decision to go towards the best place. And that's what I have on the right side of the screen, the neighboring search uh, approach. And obviously, we also know that's not true because it's, it's unlikely that a fish would be able to sense large scale gradients in the environment to the point that, you know, on a three or five kilometer grid, it could make such an informed decision. So the type of behavior that we've favored in, in these models um, is called kinesis, which is uh, also called happiness-based behavior. And it's kind of a, a trade-off between a random walk and a very smart fish in the sense that where you're in the location where you're satisfying some cue or behavior that could be temperature or that could be consumption, then you try to maintain yourself in that environment. So you slow down, you keep moving in a straight line. And if you find yourself in an environment that is outside conditions that you would normally seek, then you start doing random motion to explore the environment and find a better place. But the bottom line here is that behavior is typically the most difficult component of an individual base model. And unfortunately, the results are also very sensitive to what type of behavior you decide to use. So it's important that you use a behavior that you can actually sensibly parameterized or at least know enough about the cues so that you can implement a behavior that doesn't put in the answer, but that, that's also more interesting than a random walk. And over the years, we've used different combination of bioenergetics and behavior. So I've listed here um, a few publication uh, with different species, juvenile salmon, forage fish, and California sea lions, where essentially we used a bioenergetics component and a behavior component that matched what we knew about those species. Um, a quick slide to make the connection to um, being able to do a climate to fish or end to end ecosystem model. Um, it would take a an extremely large amount of computer resources to run everything coupled from a nurse system model to the individual base model. So to, to make the computation doable is we've actually started to do an approach where we run in progressive steps and we only do the direct downscaling of the physics. Um, and then we run the biogeochemistry and the individual base model offline um, after having saved the physical field at high enough resolution so that the offline solution gives the same answer as a truly coupled solution. Um, and this is the approach that you would use to do a long historical simulation based on forcing from a reanalysis product or what you would use to do a climate projection based on a projection from a nurse system model that you would regionally downscale in this case for the California current. The most difficult part here is to actually demonstrate that your model is, has some skill and it also has skill for the right reason. Um, and this is difficult because it's always hard to track how uncertainty will propagate from the physics to the biogeochemistry to the higher trophic levels. Um, and honestly, beyond physics and some biogeochemical variable, there is extremely few direct observation that allow you to really thoroughly evaluate what the result of the individual base model um, or the skill of those individual base model results. And, and so the approach you take is you actually evaluate each component of the coupled or the, uh, the physics to fish model, but you have to keep in mind that those individual components um, interact with each other. And, and often the only way to do a proper evaluation of your model is to rely on 
long historical simulation um, and try to see if the model reproduces at least the characteristics that you're interested in um, those species well enough that the model can be used to draw a conclusion about bottom-up or top-down control on their um, population dynamics. And just to give you um, a check I'm doing on time here, uh, but just to give you a quick overview of how you would go about doing evaluation, uh, so this is at the level where you can still do it um, with enough data. So this is trying to evaluate the patterns of krill hotspots produced by the model, and we're able to compare this with acoustics observation and with net troll. Um, so you know this is probably as good of a data set as you have to evaluate krill hotspots or krill distribution in the California current. Um, once you get to the next, uh, and so sorry, for this slide, we, we were able to evaluate both the spatial pattern and the temporal variability in the simulated krill distribu distribution through those um, two types of observation. Once you go to fish, and this is an example for uh, how you would evaluate that the model is reproducing the characteristics of the sardine population correctly, then really you have information from lendings or uh, stock biomass estimates, which is the blue line here in the top panel. And then you're trying to see what part of the signal the model is able to reproduce. And that's the red is the prediction from the model in how sardine population biomass varied between 1980 and 2010. Uh, the other way that you would try to evaluate the model is to try to see if you're growing the sardine at the proper rate. So the bottom left panel shows you a weight at age distribution. So are your two-year-old sardine the same size in the model as you would expect in the environment. And then you can also look at spawning stock biomass to recruit relationship to see if for a given size population you're creating enough or you're creating the right amount of recruitment um, into the next year uh, population. But it gets, it gets very difficult because you start, you know, not having sufficient information to really establish if all the components of your model are reproducing um, observed pattern and especially observed pattern for the right reason. Uh, this is an example of evaluating the model for California sea lions. In this case, we were extremely lucky to have satellite tags for a subset of the sea lion population. So the black dots that you see are the actual satellite tracks of sea lions. And then the red um, temperature in the bottom panel is the temperature from those satellite tracks that were on the sea lion. And then all the color dots and the black line in the bottom is what the model predicts in terms of where the sea lions went forage and the temperature that they experienced. So this is probably as good a validation as you can hope to do uh, with an individual base model, uh, in this case for sea lion. And we're able to establish that the model was able to reproduce the change in foraging pattern between 2004 and 2005, where sea lions predominantly um, forage near shore in 2004 and forage much further offshore in 2005, which was an anomalous year in the California current with delayed upwelling conditions. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of a flavor on how you go about to try to evaluate um, those climate to fish or climate to marine mammal species uh, models. And just to give you, to finish a little bit of an overview of the type of results that you can get from the simulation, and I'll give you a couple of examples for a historical simulation and a couple of examples for a climate projection. Um, so running 
the uh, the end-to-end -end model for sardine and anchovy allowed us to determine historically what has driven change in the population of sardine and anchovy. And we're able to establish that what drives intraannual variability for anchovy is primarily tied to change in the intensity of coastal upwelling, which leads in higher or lower prey availability and then higher growth and higher egg production. And we're able to contrast this with what favors sardine and sardine really responded to regionally warmer SST condition, which increased um, or led to faster egg development, egg development and led to increased survival um, to, uh, to the adult stage. Uh, but what was interesting is then to try to, because both sardine and anchovy are prey items for the California sea lions, is to see if based on this, we could understand what drives change in the foraging pattern and success of um, California sea lions. And so here we used an EOF approach where we calculated um, EOFs of the distribution of sea lions EOFs of the distribution of sardine, EOFs of the distribution and anchovy, and tried to relate their spatial patterns and temporal amplitude. And what we found is that the success of feeding or how long the sea lions spent at sea foraging was directly related to the availability of sardine near shore. And that makes sense because sardine is, has a higher energetic content than the other prey. So if sardines are available, near shore, then the sea lions don't have to spend that much time or do shorter trips to satisfy their energetic demands on a given day. Um, and then what I was describing earlier in terms of the near shore versus offshore foraging, we were actually able to relate this to changes in sea surface temperature in the central California current where sea lions would go forage further offshore in warmer period, like the 97, 98 El Nino or the 2005 delayed upwelling. So again, this is probably one of the main benefit of running these types of model is you can try to start understanding mechanistically what are the connection between the environment and different species at different trophic levels. And how much time do I have? I have a couple more minutes. Let's start wrapping up if you can. All right. Okay. So quickly, the climate projection. Um, we've used this approach to try to understand using three different um, climate models or Earth system model from the CMIP-5 ensemble. What would happen if we ran projection of sardine distribution and abundance using those three um, or system model downscaled for the California current. And so this is a paper that was just submitted and it, it, it actually starts getting at the point of how accurately can we predict the effect of climate change on um, species at different trophic levels, both on their abundance and on their distribution. And again, because you run a model where all the components are coupled to some extent, you can try to understand, you can start to understand what drives the change in the population. And for example, here with, in terms of determining change in the distribution, we realized that it's actually the availability of proper thermal habitat that drove change in the distribution of the population. And you see this for a low warming and a high warming case, the GFDL and Hadley um, or system model solution, that food is always good throughout the end of the century for all of the California current region. What disappear is the proper thermal habitat for sardine, and that compresses the population towards the northern part of the, ca the California current. Uh, and I'm going to skip this slide in the interest of time, uh, but because the individual base model also has a um, fishing fleet component uh, that allows us to actually understand how catch of sardine may change in the future and the, you know, obviously impact, economic impact that could have on the sardine fisheries in, in the California current. 
And by and large, what we find is consistent with the shift in <clears throat> the population is that catch is going to start increasing in the northern part of the California current to the detriment of the central and southern part of the California current. And I'll stop here and I'll conclude with this is uh, is it easy to do? Uh, no. Is it fun? Extremely, because you get to decide what those species do. Uh, is it doable? Hopefully I've convinced you that to some extent, yes, we can start understanding the mechanism that lead to the formation of ecosystem hotspots or ecosystem structure that drive the population dynamics of certain species. Thank you for your attention and I'll take questions if we have time. Yep. Thank you so much for your presentation. So we'll take the next few minutes for questions. I already see a few uh, hands raised. So let's go ahead to Shane. Go ahead, go ahead. Hello, Jerome. Um, can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Um, thank you very much for this presentation. I, I especially enjoy uh, the last part that you went over very quickly. Uh, that paper looks very interesting, the one just submitted. Um, I think in the first comparison between model and observations that you showed, um, I guess with the CRAIL, I think I noticed that the variable from observations or from model that you were comparing were not the same. Can you explain a little bit why is that? Yeah, let me uh, see if I can share back i guess is um this one you're referring to yes i think so yeah yeah so you so, have two different variables yeah so it's, it's it's just that we had two sources of information for krill one is a depth integrated signal from acoustics and that um is not as reliable to examine temporal variability, but it's a really good way to determine whether the model is reproducing the spatial structure of the trail distribution. So that's what the top panels show here is you have the model predicted trail distribution, the one from the acoustics, and then a regression of model to observed trail in terms of how spatially the model explains the variability and we determined that the model explains about 50% of the spatial variability that's contained in the observation. And obviously the magnitude of those hotspots is a little bit different between the acoustics and the model. The model over or emphasizes more the Monterey Bay, Gulf of the Fairlawn hotspot, uh, whereas the observation emphasizes more the point conception fixer hotspot. But you see those, you know, the pattern of higher abundance and then lower abundance north of point rays. So that's what we we're trying to establish using the acoustics observation. And then we use. I guess I, guess I wanted to bring up the. Sorry, I just wanted to bring up the fact that you know, like the observations give you, uh, you know, a variable that is not the same that is as predicted by the model, right? So is that something common in those evaluation of like? climate to fish models that you know what you observe is actually what is not diagnosed by the by the model correct and so that's that's what i was trying to get at is that you have to as you pointed out it is exactly true you never have the exact same variable from the observation that you have from the model so you have to understand what is relatable and in that case the acoustic signal is more relatable to the spatial distribution produced by the model. And then the net surveys, which are in, you know, in catch per unit effort are more relatable to the temporal variability of the model. And obviously, you know, in this plot, um, the, although the, the temporal variability is similar, the order of magnitude is, is different. So krill, the observed krill varies on, you know, a logarithmic scale, whether and the model is on the linear scale. And you have the same thing here for the sardine population. The observation range an order of magnitude and the model does not. Um, the reason for this is because um, the biogeochemical models has quadratic mortality term for the zooplankton functional groups, which tend to dampen the amplitude of interannual fluctuation. So this is something that is known and, you know, obviously we acknowledge that even though the model reproduces 
the low frequency variability, it doesn't reproduce the amplitude of that variability. All right, thank you. Very interesting. Sure. Hopefully that was not too long of an answer and I answered your question. <laughs> So I see four uh, hands raised and we don't have too much time. Um, we're a little bit over actually. So what I'm going to do is take questions from non pause panel members um, and then pause panel members. If you do have questions, maybe you can reach out to him offline. Um, so I'm, that's I'm happy to stay on a little bit longer if there are more questions. Yeah, let's have you stay on for 2 questions and then the pause panel members can uh, reach out to you offline. Um, so Antonietta, do you have a question? Yes, um, so this was really nice, Jerome. I, um, it's a very interesting work. Um, so I was very curious about these IBS models. They seem extremely complicated, especially the behavioral part, as you uh, pointed out. Um, so how much do you actually, uh, so you, you presented these three different uh, possibilities, the dumb fish and the very smart fish and the, and the one in between. Um, how much data do you actually have to kind of to know for the given species what uh, um, uh, how much information do you have about the behavior of these species? So they can move offshore, they can move onshore, they can move uh, at, at depth. So um, how, how, how much how much data do you have to inform the choices you make? That's I think is my. Question. So, yeah, it's it's a good question. So essentially, you have to know if you know anything about the say the temperature preference of a given species. And for sardine and anchovy, we actually knew what their preference was for spawning. So those fish have a, a fairly narrow temperature range that they seek when they're reproducing, when they're spawning. So this was what we used for the temperature Q. Um, so kinesis can combine different environmental Q for behavior. Uh, and in this case, we use temperature and food. And so it's, you know, you, you make some assumption, but if it's, an informed assumption based on the expected distribution of the fish, uh, either from direct observation or from lab experiments that show a particular temperature range for either feeding or for reproduction, then you can include that information in behavior. Mm -hmm. And we did that for the sea lion too. We know that sea lions tend to forage coastally. So we use the temperature cue that allow them to seek for recently upwelled water. So a temperature signature that match that of recently upwelled water. But, but your point is well taken that it makes no sense to use a behavior like kinesis if you're just completely guessing at what temperature or food or salinity or chlorophyll preferences those fish may have. And in, in that case, you might as well default to the smart fish where you use that neighboring cell search, but you add a random, a random component. So you don't always let them go exactly where they want to go and you confuse them a little bit. And it's better to do that than to try to impose cues that you really don't know much about. Yeah, thank you. Well, I, it, it, it is very, very complicated, but I can see also how it can be a lot of fun. <laughs> it is a lot of fun. <laughs> it's kept me busy for the last 10 years. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Jerome. Thanks. All right, let's take a final question from Fred. Go ahead, Fred. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Jerome. I, I'm, I have a question kind of similar to Antonietta's. Um, so, uh, given that the, um, you know, I guess, given your last slide there or second to last slide, um, the, these species, I'm not a biologist. I'm asking this out of complete ignorance. Uh, yeah, that one. So these species, especially since we're talking about long time spans, they can actually evolve and modify their behavior, right? So, so isn't it possible that a species like a sardine 
um, could evolve to be, uh, you know, in, in warmer water? And if, if so, is that something that, that would be possible to put into your models? You can. So it's, it's something that we've been thinking about is to, so whenever you create, so this is a full life cycle model. So the adult will actually spawn eggs, which will develop into larval fish and juvenile and, and into adult. So you could actually, when you create a new fish, um, when, you know, when an egg becomes a larvae, you could start changing their optimal temperature for movement to a higher, a slightly higher temperature, for example. And you could, in that way, try to include some level of evolution. Now, you know, you expect sardine to be probably between five and 10 years old um, in, in the population, the, the older adults. So, you know, over a hundred years period, you're looking at 10 to 15 generations. Um, I don't know that this is from an evolutionary point of view long enough to justify doing it, but from a computer point of view, and that's the, uh, it's definitely fun part of doing this. You could certainly start biasing optimal temperatures used for movement to slightly higher values and see how eventually that affects the distribution of, of the fish over time. Okay, thank you. All right, I think that will end uh, today's pause panel webinar. So I wanna give you a big thank you, Jerome, for the talk and to all of our participants, uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, so I'll send out an announcement for our next pause panel webinar. Um, and then the recording for Jerome's talk will be available, I'm hoping for next week. Um, so again, if you have a question from him that we weren't able to get to, maybe we can, um, you, you can reach out to me, get the contact information and I can put you guys in touch. So thank you all for participating.